Okay, we are in the book of Amos. Very, very surprising book in many ways. Amos was a businessman. We see him as, a, as an agriculturalist, but in many ways. He was a herder, a breeder, fig trees, other things. And the figs didn't grow in Tekoa, they grew in the lowlands. So that means he was a man of property. Many people don't realize that. He's from the southern kingdom. And we'll get into that in a minute anyway. This is the third session of what will probably be like five sessions, to give you a rough feeling of where we are. We're going to explore chapters five and six tonight. Now, just to give you a perspective of these minor prophets, as we call them, you know, obviously, that after Solomon died, the nation Israel had a civil war, and they divided into two houses, as they called it. The southern group called themselves Judah. The northern group called them, uh, we we're going to call the northern kingdom. We do, I favor that term only because when you say Israel, it's sometimes confusing whether you mean the house of Israel, the northern kingdom, or whether you're referring to the whole nation by that name. And we'll try to highlight when we know what it is, but we, when we're, you know, it, we generally can tell, and when, it, when I articulate it, I'll usually speak of the northern king, the meaning of the northern house. But to improve this chart, the, the, the top part of the chart is the part, the part that's covered by the first book of Kings. The, bo the bottom half is second Kings. And I'm going to expand it so, I can, so you can read it a little bit better. And uh, we have a, a group of, the, we have the two kingdoms, but we also have a Syrian there shown on the right side. The, because the northern kingdom is going to be captured by Assyria. Well in, well in advance of that captivity, we find the capital of that, Nineveh, in our Bible, in that Jonah has an incident with Nineveh, in which they're destined for destruction, 40 days and you get yours, and they do a surprising thing, they repent, and they get a whole other century. That upset Jonah, because he didn't want them to repent, he wanted them wiped out. But anyway, and uh, so we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, uh, anyway, that's the, that's the, it was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. The southern kingdom is going to get captured by the Babylonians and brought into captivity. What may, many people don't realize, that when Babylon rises to power, it takes over the Assyrian Empire. So the Assyrians get commingled, and their captives get commingled with Babylon. Many people overlook that. That's going to be relevant when we start talking about ten lost tribes and all that. The Lord didn't lose any ten tribes, by the way. That's a, that's a misnomer from some misunderstanding of certain scriptures. Anyway, after they... Now, what's, you, the northern kingdom gets wiped out from history. They go into captivity. They get distributed throughout that empire. And they never return as a corporate entity anymore. And we'll deal with some of that as we go. The ones that were believers migrated south where it was politically correct to worship in the temple. The ones that didn't want to do idol worship went north where it was politically correct to do so. So there's commingling of people. Don't confuse the ethnology, the family trees, with the regions they live in. Yes, they were assigned originally that way, but they get commingled as life goes on. So when they speak of Ephraim, that may mean an Ephraimite that's of the tribe of Ephraim, or it may simply mean someone who lives in that region. I'm a Californian. Okay. I'm now in Idaho. So am I, a, am I from California because I used to live there? Or am I California because I was born there? Okay. One of those is true, the other one isn't. Doesn't matter. But the anyway, point is, there's some ambiguities. Don't let those mess you up. Anyway, the good news about the Southern Kingdom is when they, after they finish their 70 years sentence, as, as it were, they are freed, and you have what we call the post-exile period. Now, um, we have major prophets because they have the largest books. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. We call them major because they're bigger. Okay, Isaiah is contemporaneous uh, with a number of kings in the southern kingdom, followed by Jeremiah who, bra who, who bridges the end of the southern kingdom's freedom into the period of the captivity. And uh, Ezekiel, uh, well Daniel, is captured in the first deportation and he, he prophesies from Babylon during that captivity. Ezekiel is still in Jerusalem, but he prophesies of it from Jerusalem. Okay? And he's in the second deportation to, to Israel. And, uh, okay, so, so now we have the minor prophets. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zeph Zechariah, and Malachi. Why are they in that order? I have no idea. <laughs> okay? And I want to talk a little bit about that to help you 
try to put these in perspective. Um, obviously, Elisha, by the way, is one of the prophets. Elijah was pre predecessor to him in, in the First Kings era. In Second Kings, Elisha takes his place, but he's not a writing prophet. So we don't have the book of Elisha, see. But he was a prophet to the northern kingdom. But Hosea was also a prophet to the northern kingdom. Uh, Joel is earlier than both of them a prophet to the southern kingdom. Now Amos, is a, the one we're going to study, is kind of strange because he actually lived in the southern kingdom as a businessman, but God taps him on the shoulder and says, I want you to deliver a message to the northern kingdom. And he does. He goes to the northern kingdom and his writings, of course, the book we're going to study. And so he's not welcome there. He's a southerner. They're northerners. And, uh, and he has a very unpleasant message for them. That's his burden. He's very, by the way, he's, a, he's an agriculturalist, he's a businessman, but he's very articulate. Fabulous writing, it turns out. But anyway, move on here. Uh, then we have Obadiah, who really, uh, 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 anyway, he's down there in, in the, almost the captivity period, but he really talks about the Edomites a lot. Uh, we have um, Nahum also goes to Nineveh, but this time they don't repent, and that's when they lose it. The Assyrian, the, the, the Assyrian Empire goes down. And... Uh, to get Babylon. Habakkuk and uh, Zephaniah are uh, also in the southern kingdom. In the post-exile period, we've got Zerubbabel, and the period of Zerubbabel reigns so over. We have Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, and uh, that may, th that's the order in your Bible, and that's the order that makes sense. Okay. After Malachi, we have 400 years before the New Testament that some people call the silent years. They are in your Bible, but most people don't know where to look. If you go to Daniel chapter 11, 5 through 35, it details them, those years, with an amazing precision. In chrono if we look at this chronologically before the exile, you've got Obadiah, Jonah, Joel, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, and Micah, to their various things as indicated, and named in Nineveh, and then Zephaniah. So it covers the, the 9th century B.C. down to the 6th century B.C. And uh, so and, and so on all the way down to Jeremiah, who bridges into the exile. Amos is in that period to give you a feeling of timing. It's to the northern kingdom, contemporaneous with Hosea, pretty much, and they, they in effect, see it to the end. Um, so during the exile, of course, we have Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, as I mentioned. After the exile, we have the three I've mentioned, and I've covered that. Now, if I was organizing these, I would suggest a different order. I'm saying this, not that it's better, I'm just trying to give you a perspective here. I would put them in this order, and I'll blow it up so you can see better. I take the northern kingdom, with, because it fell first, I have Hosea and jo uh, Amos in that order first. Then we have three of the prophets that aren't speaking to either Judah or Israel, they're speaking to the Gentiles. Obadiah is really speaking against the Edomites, which are uh, like the Ishmaelites in effect. Then we have Jonah and Nahum against Assyria. So they're all, those are a little different style than the others. The southern kingdom, of course, we have Joel, Micah, Zephaniah, and Habakkuk. That makes sense. And uh, they, you know, that, that's where they're from, and that's what they dealt with. And, of course, the post-exile, as I said, right. So Amos is what we're interested in. And so that's in the period of Jeroboam II in uh, the northern kingdom, uh, for the most part. And uh, now in the southern king, King Uzziah reigned in Ju Judah. He was a good king. He enjoyed the Lord's blessing. He subdued the Philistines to the southwest. The Ammonites paid him tribute. He conquered the Arabians to the south. And his fame spread to the borders of Egypt. So it's a prosperous time for the southern kingdom. They're not having war with the northern anymore. They had a war for a while, but that's behind them. They're both, pro they're both peaceful and both prospering. And they both had large standing armies, by the way. Now Amos came from the southern kingdom, who called himself Judah. He was contemporary with Zion. But he is sent to the northern kingdom that calls itself the house of Israel. Let's talk about it. Jeroboam II, he's the fourth king of the Jehu dynasty. He ruled in Samaria. That was their capital for the northern kingdom. And they're having a prosperous time that's unparalleled for them. He, uh, uh, there's just a whole boom of prosperity ever, all the way through. He had a reign of 41 years. The boundaries of the northern kingdom, to the west, Lebanon coastal plain was retaken from Syria. In the north, Damascus itself had been subjugated. In the southeast, they controlled pagan Moab. And to the south, Jeroboam II's father, Joash, and Joash, 
defeated Judah in war. So they had a war to the south, but it's been settled. They're at peace. But the south to them is a buffer to their other potential enemies. So it's good news. The northern kingdom is having a ball. Jeroboam said, returned the retained the strength over the southern kingdom. Uzziah kept Ammon under control to the east, Eden to the south, Philistia to the west, southwest. So with ironclad military strength and ironclad defensive configuration, Syria, a buffer against the Syria to the east, and the impassable Galani uh, mountains to the east. Judah was a buffer against Egypt to the south, and the Mediterranean, of course, is to the west. They got it made. They don't have any impending threats to them. Peace and the power of conquest over 41 years. Think about that. New markets, trade in every direction, a growing wealthy class. Many had summer and winter homes. They had a BMW in each garage. That's a missler translation. And uh, but you can't help but recall the opening line of Charles Dickens' famous story about the tale of two cities, of London and Paris. It says, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. And uh, that, in that paradox lies the tale. From their point of view, it was the best of times. They were prosperous. Everybody's doing great. From God's point of view, it's never been worse. And judgment is coming. That's the throne. Now, I appreciate you all turning out tonight to, to study the book of Amos. It's part of the Old Testament. It's something you want to l learn. Many people, uh, you know, it's, it's not as studied as it should be, so I applaud your being here as just diligent Bible students. But I want to highlight something else for you to consider as we go. It's possible that God has you here for another reason. It's possible that the book of Amos has a message for us today that's uniquely ours today. And part of your challenge as we get into this book is to see for yourself the possible parallels between the predicament of the northern kingdom and the predicament of the country we live in. We the average person thinks we're the richest country in the world. It's not true. We're bankrupt. Our way of life is dependent upon borrowing foreign money. We were built on a set of heritage that God talks about that they have abandoned. And God's going to hold them accountable. Anyway, we could go on and on, but we'll let the text speak for itself. But I open your hearts to that possibility that God might have something here for you that may come as a surprise to be tucked away in a little small book of the Old Testament. Prosperity. Northern Kingdom, to whom Amos' message was directed, was at the zenith of its power. Aram, think of that as Syria, had not recovered from her defeat in 802 BC by Assyria. Don't confuse Aram and Assyria. Aram is equivalent to what we think of Assyria. Assyria is larger than that, the empire. Anyway, under Adad Nirari uh, III, uh, Assyria, however, had been unable to press her advantage further. A succession of inept rulers and troublesome Eratines uh, uh, to her north kept Assyria preoccupied until the accession of Tiglath Pileser III, who will rise in power and subjugate ultimately the south, southern kingdom. Anyway, given a free hand, Jeroboam II was able to extend his borders northward to Aramean territory and to reclaim Israel's lands east of the Jordan. And because of the control this gave Israel over the trade routes, wealth began to accumulate in her cities. Commerce thrived, an upper class emerged, expensive homes were built, the rich enjoyed an indolent, indulgent lifestyle. Does that remind you of anyone you know? The poor became targets for legal and economic exploitation. The word poor is an ancient Hebrew term for taxpayer. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Slavery for debt was easily accepted. Ask your congressman about that. Standards of morality had sunk to a low ebb. Jeroboam I had instituted idolatry 150 years earlier. Think about that. Idolatry was installed 150 years earlier at Dan and Bethel, two regions. Two regions. And this mimicked, in a sense, deliberately, Aaron's golden calf of 700 years earlier than that, and from the book of the, and from the Exodus. Anyway, religion flourished. Get that clear. Religion was flourishing. 
We're talking religion. The most anti-religious person that ever walked the planet Earth is a guy by the name of Jesus Christ. Understand that. It was that understanding that led to the Jesus Revolution of the 70s, when the kids discovered that he was anti-religious. Praise God for that. Yeah. So the people throng for the shrines for the yearly festivals, and these are the Jewish festivals. They're not, they're taking Judaism plus idols. Well, we still do that, but they're worshiping idols. Okay. You know, if you take a glass of milk and put poison in it, it's still, there's a lot of good milk there, but it's still poisonous, right? Okay. Anyway, they were enthusiastically offering sacrifices according to the law and what have you. Law plus. They steadfastly maintained that their God was with them and they considered themselves immune to disaster. Really? They did not welcome this uninvited prophet from the south, Amos. His message was that Israel was experiencing mercy before the storm. His message is God's impending judgment. And I'm tempted to throw in here Thomas Jefferson. Seven, uh, uh, 1781. I tremble for my country when I recall that God is just, and His justice will not sleep forever. So the question is, is there a parallel today? I don't know. So we had an introduction to Amos, the first chapter, and then we went through eight judgments. And Amos goes through and talks about Damascus, Gaza, Tyre, Edom, Ammon, Moab. These are all heathen nations. And then Judah. And uh, see, the first uh, six there are heathens. He goes through all of them. And then he talks about their neighbors to the south, Judah. What's he doing? He's setting the stage for his real message, which is to Israel, the northern kingdom. He's setting the stage for that. Because once he gets down that far, he's going to turn to some... Um, he's got three sermons then. Israel's past, uh, present, past, and future in chapters 4 and 5. And then five visions of judgment that come up. And then we have the big wrap-up at the end. The Davidic kingdom restored. And let me tell you frankly that ninth, those last few verses of this book will come as a shock to them probably. It certainly will be a shock to most churches because it deals with something that most churches don't believe is going to happen. And we'll talk about that when we get there. That uh, it's, it's the big punch, if you will. But let's get it. Let's, so last time we looked at the first two sermons in chapters 3 and 4. And tonight we're going to focus on chapters 5 and 6. Okay? So false religion will be condemned in the first 17 verses. Then we have three issues. Accusation, judgment, and appeal. So let's jump in. Amos chapter 5, verse 1. Hear ye this word which I take up against you, even a lamentation, O house of Israel. Hear ye this word. That's a partitioning phrase. We saw it in chapter 3, chapter 4, and now chapter 5. It partitions the text. Even a lamentation. The word lamentation actually is a dirge, a kina, a mournful song, a lamentation. The call for lamentation treats the nation as if it's already dead. It's like giving a funeral oratory over it. That's the flavor here. Diagnosing a fatal disease can cause the sufferer to evaluate his or her life. This is an appeal to people to evaluate their view of reality. Shouldn't we be doing the same thing? That is evaluated from the Lord's point of view. The nation is about to die. Judgment is inevitable. I do want to remind you that was Jonah's message to Nineveh. Forty days and you get yours. Forty days comes destruction. And the king on spec, Jonah didn't preach unless you repent, this is all going to happen. No, no, you didn't like John the Baptist, repent or else. No, 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 it's coming. In 40 days you get yours. And the king reasoned that maybe, if God is just, if we repent, he might give us a, a reprieve. He did that on speculation. He did, and God did. And Jonah's really upset. The mystery of the book of Jonah is, why is that fourth chapter even there? 
He went and pouted over the whole thing. Anyway. The virgin of Israel has fallen. She shall no more rise. She is forsaken upon her land. There is none to raise her up. She's a fallen woman. And she actually fell in 722 B.C., which is subsequent to this, never to rise as a nation again. This is a prophecy that, came, that, that, that in effect, it was fulfilled. Now, it does not deny ultimate restoration of the nation Israel. The northern house ceases to exist. In the millennium, there will be one new Israel that will be north and south put together, that will be united through Judah, and the line of David will unite it. And we'll be talking a lot about that when we get to chapter 9, verse 11, which was quoted by James at the Council for Jerusalem, which is the peak, pivotal point in the New Testament. We'll talk about that when we get there. Third verse, For thus saith the Lord God, The city that went out by a thousand shall leave a hundred, and that which went forth by a hundred shall leave ten to the house of Israel. There's a technical term for that. It's called decimation. Deci means ten. Cut down to one-tenth, each one. Decimated through forced exodus and resettlements. Their national existence ended. God meant it back in Deuteronomy 28. And you can compare Deuteronomy 28 verse 62 with Amos 5.3, and they match pretty well. Thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me, and ye shall live. Seek. Darash. To seek or search after, to apply oneself to study, to follow someone or something. In the Midrash it's called seeking. But seek not Bethel, nor enter into Gilgal, and pass not to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to naught. We've got Bethel, fallen to abominations. It's described as a hold of demons. Beersheba is about 25 miles south of Hebron. That's really down there in the Negev. Uh, he also had, it, it also had an illustrious history to inspire religious attachments. It started back to God's promises to Hagar. In Genesis 21, it involves Beersheba. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree there and called upon the name of Yodhivave. Genesis 21. Is Isaac built, uh, Itzhak built an altar there. Elijah encountered an angel a day's journey into the desert from there. Josiah desecrated the high places from Geba to Beersheba. Pilgrimages for, for worship of idols. We're going to compare that to Chapter 8, we're going to, that's going to come up again. And now we talk about Gilgal. This forms a pun, actually, on the term, go into captivity. So there's a pun on the name of the place, which has its reasons, but it's also a pun on that. Gilgal and Bethel will become an empty place. The word awen means empty, uh, 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 empty place. And he, he, he imitates another name for Bethel as beth Avon. Seek the Lord, and ye shall live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and devour it, and there be none to quench it in Bethel. The house of Joseph. Now, Joseph, you may recall, was, spoke for two tribes, because his, his father uh, adopts, the, Jacob adopts, his, his two sons, Joseph's two sons, to be his sons. That's why you have 13 tribes. If you want 12, you combine Ephraim and Manasseh to make Joseph. If you want to have 12 and drop out Levi for some reason, then you split him into two tribes. If you're trying to list the tribes and exclude Dan for some reason, the Holy Spirit does that not frequently, then you see you got 13. It's a baker's dozen, is the idea. Okay. And new Bible te uh, students sometimes get confused. Right, how many are there? There's 13 to choose from to make 12. Because you get 12, whether or not you count, you can take one of them and not count it and still have 12, is the point. But never is it 11. Never is it 13. It's always 12 in, in c concept here. Ye who turn judgment to wormwood and leave off righteousness in the earth. Now verses 7 through 9 here are re reckoned by some of the scholars as the loftiest of inspired poetry. In the actual Hebrew, this is elegant, elegant language. Now in the translation we lose all that, of course, but this is interesting because Amos was a businessman, and yet he comes across as a poet. And Wormwood, 
uh, le'ena is a, it means bitter tasting and a poisonous root is what it refers to. Seek him that maketh the seven stars in Orion, and turneth the shadow of death into morning, and maketh the day dark with night, that calleth for the waters of the sea, and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. Who? Wait a minute. What's going on here? Seek him. Who? The Lord. Who is the Lord? Him that maketh the seven stars and Orion. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. Who is their Lord? He's the one that turneth the shadow of death into morning and maketh the day dark with night. He called for waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. This is the Lord in judgment. The seven stars. What's the name for that? Anybody know? Pleiades. Good for you. The seven sisters. The Pleiades. Very well known. It's in, in, in a constellation called Taurus. Also known as Seven Sisters, referred to in Job chapter 9 and chapter 38. It's chapter 38 that fascinates me. I'll show you why in a minute. We have Orion here. How many can pick out Orion in the sky? People who cannot pick out any other constellations, there's two they can always pick out. Cassiopeia, the bent W that we call, that points to the northern star, and Orion, because you can see his belt and all that. Okay. Orion is mentioned several times in the Bible. Did you know that? Orion is the chief constellation in the winter sky. And if you haven't studied this, I encourage you to study Psalm 19, because the heavens declare the glory of God. Really? In a broad metaphorical sense? No. With specificity that will startle you if you take the trouble to study it. I won't get into it here. But there's a passage in Job. Who are, he gives, God gives Job a, lion, a science quiz. Tell me if you can, who can loose the bands of Orion? The Pleiades and Orion are mentioned in a special way. They are banded together somehow. Some astronomers argue that they're, they're hooked together by gravity. But that's nonsense. Because anyone that knows anything about the law of gravity knows that it's the, the equation is the product of two masses divided by the square of the distance between them. And when you start applying that in astronomical distances, uh, gravity evaporates as not being relevant. We now know that what ties them together is electricity, plasma, okay? And we have that little thing down here because we just got through recording some materials on that. But the point is... What's interesting is we now understand through plasma physics that how these constellations are bound together. And the seven, the Pleiades and Orion are bound together. And can, you, can you loose the, ban the bands of Orion? Astronomers to this day can't explain it unless they are the exception that understand plasma physics. Astronomy leans heavily on the technology of the 17th and 18th centuries up to Newton. Astronomers don't do their homework with James Clark Maxwell and the Maxwell equations and what follows. And it's only been in recent years that the plasma physicists have come to fore to be taken seriously and we're now discovering that their entire view is demonstrable in the laboratory. It's empirically based. The sun is not a thermonuclear process going on. It's a light bulb that draws its energy from the fabric of space. And we now know that and that mathematically uh, it all checks out. Check it out. Bring it along for fun. Let's move on here. Lord Yorhevafe, he is Israelites worship the stars. His power would make us respect and serve him. That's as valid today as it was 2700 years ago that strengthened and spoiled against the strong, so that the spoiled shall come against the fortress. See, Amos now rebukes Israel for their mistreatment of the poor, aiming specifically at dishonest business practices and the perversion of justice. You know, it really is a shock when you start looking at our own culture. What, it's not just the politicians that have become corrupt. The courts, the media, the educational establishment, corrupt, especially from God's point of view. And, uh, well, we go on and on. Let's get on here. 
Anyway, does that sound familiar is my question. The Lord himself will apply the justice that is lacking from their courts, is what's implied here. They hate him that rebuketh in the gate, and they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. The, word, the correction is rebuffed. Reproves. The word is yachech, in the, to, to be straight. He who would stand for God must expect the opposition and evil speaking of the unspiritual and worldly minded. Why are we surprised? The servant is not greater than the master. Why should we think we would be privileged where Christ was not? Those who would stand for God must expect the opposition and evil speaking of the unspiritual and worldly minded. Why are we surprised? Amos hopes that some of his present audience might form part of the remnant of Joseph and escape the coming judgment. Some will. Amos was not seeking popularity with the multitude. We're not looking for seeker-friendly synagogues here. Okay? Verse 11. For as much therefore as your treading is upon the poor, and you take from him the burdens of wheat, ye have built houses of hewn stone, but ye shall not dwell in them. Ye have planted pleasant vineyards, but ye shall not drink wine of them. Judgments to fit the crime. Bribes are explicitly pro uh, prohibited. Exodus 23, Numbers 35, Deuteronomy 16, and lots of other places. The land belonged to the Lord by the sign to various families or tribes. They were not to be bought or sold permanently. The year of Jubilee was intended to restore the land to its rightful condition. See, when they sold a property, we, it's not fee simple like we think of a sale. It was really what we call a lease. They bought the use of the land for a period of time. They would call that a sale. We don't look... We, we get confused because we deal real estate differently in our culture. But anyway, they were not bought or sold. They were, they, every 50 years it returned to its original owner. And so those, those leases were canceled in effect. <laughs> in the King James you find the word leasing. It actually means lying. And I always think that's pretty funny to show those verses to a car dealer, you know. Now, it's a different old English term. Anyway, the rich were in fact forcing the poor into a status of tenant farmers who will not enjoy their fine homes. In the restoration, the reverse will be true. Their prosperity was only temporary. Judgment patterned after the curses, of course, in the Torah. Deuteronomy 28 and uh, also Micah 6 and Zephaniah 1. For I know your manifold transgressions, God says, your mighty sins, they afflict the just they take a bribe, they turn aside the poor in the gate from their right. Therefore the prudent shall keep silence in that time, for it is an idle time. Amos is not condoning the silence in the face of evil, he's simply describing the evil times. Amos also had to face the consequences for his outspokenness when Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, confronted him. That will occur, there's a little historical interlude in chapter 7 we'll come to when we get to chapter 7. Seek good and not evil that ye may live, and so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as ye have spoken. So here repentance is solicited. The need to be, in effect, born again. Seek good and not evil that ye may live. Hate the evil and love the good, and establish judgment at the gate. It may be that the Lord of God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. Perhaps, in other words. It may be. Perhaps. That holds out hope for a late repentance. And that's probably a message we should never forget. God always will respond to true repentance. Remember personally the Christian's bar of soap. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's His faithfulness you can count on, not yours. But if you confess, he says, if you confess your sins, I, uh, uh, he, uh, uh, he will forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He will do that. He promises to. Think of some examples. We've got Ahab, Hezekiah, Levi, the sin with Simeon, scattering a blessing. The remnant of Joseph, 60 years earlier, Hazael and Ben-Hadad of Syria con uh, conquered much of the northern kingdom. These, these were all opportunities of deliverance. In time of Joash and Jeroboam II, all the conquered territory 
had been retaken. This is all the Lord's doing. The threat to the nation is certain. Potential survivors in Amos' day were calling that a remnant, the remnant of Joseph. The remnant from Judah will be talked, it's talked about in Isaiah 6 and elsewhere. Let's continue verse 16. Therefore the Lord, the God of hosts, the, the Lord, saith thus, Wailing shall be in all streets, and they shall say in all the highways, Alas, alas! And they shall call the husbandmen to mourning, and such as are skillful of lamentation to wailing. Accumulation of titles. The climax, judgment from which there is no appeal. They were collecting property. They're going to eat it, if you will. And in all vineyards shall be wailing, for I will pass through thee, saith the Lord. They, he's going to pass through like he did in Egypt, the death, of, the death of the firstborn. This is a challenge to their view of reality. We all suffer from an imperfect view of reality. We certainly see it in our politics and our economy. We're also discovering it even in our physics and our astronomy. Our perceptions are far from re real. The Lord has re rejected their perspective on what pleases Him. They, they, they think they know how to please the Lord. The Lord's going to straighten that out very quick. They, he's rejected their perspective on what pleases Him and what they are relying on for their security. What is your security relying on? You feel secure? Why? What is it relying on? They were deceiving themselves. They were deceiving themselves about the truth of the day of the Lord. Verses 18 to 20. They deceived themselves about the truth about what God requires from His people. What does, our, what does God really require of us? Good question. They deceive themselves about the truth about what God will do to the people because of their sins. They're lying to themselves about the day of the Lord, about what requires of us, and what's going to do, what God's going to do about them. He, Amos continues, Woe unto you the desire of the day of the Lord. Really? To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Really? Are you looking for the day of the Lord? Or are you looking for the, are you looking for the rapture? When you're looking for the rapture, that's, that's a step in the right direction. Are you ready? Suppose the Lord came tomorrow. What is your report card going to look like in front of the beam of seat of Christ? You're saved. If you're saved in Christ, you're saved. It's done deal. What's going to happen at the beam of seat? What have you got? God saved you. What have you done with it? That'll be the question. Those who long for it, the day of the Lord. The wicked are always blinded to the light of truth and refuse to look at it. And incidentally, our day, come at any time. You're going to face traffic going home. You have no idea what kind of madman may come out of the left field. Our day can come at any time. Reply to the cynics and the self-deceived hypocrites who had ridiculed him. He knew the prophecy of Joel chapter 3, 60 years before. That's the question. Those who desired deliverance had to call upon the Lord in repentance. That was in Joel 2. As if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him, and he went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. In other words, no matter what you do, you ain't going to win here. From bad to worse. The, re the real one word summary of that, it's inescapable. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feast days. God's God speaking about His feast days. I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. But what they're dealing with is sacerdotalism. That's a doctrine that ceremonies themselves can grant righteousness to the pers participant. That's false religion, even in Christian terms. Taking communion doesn't grant righteousness. It can be beneficial in a meditative mode, of course. But this is one of the, one of the places that the Catholicism, where they worship the Eucharist, is way off base. Way off base. 
That's what we mean by sacerdotalism. That somehow the ceremonies, it's a doctrine that the ceremonies themselves grant anything. No, they're ceremonies. They're memorials. They're demonstrations. They're illustrations. Only Christ can do those things. Not his mother. Not little wafers that represent him in a, in a process. No, no. That's sacerdotalism. God used the word hate. They refuse to hate evil. Do we? Do we hate evil? True faith is necessary, Romans 4 tells us. How do we? It's evidenced by work, James 2 tells us. Justice and righteousness is sorely needed. We see that all through the Old Testament, not just the New. There is a, what I'll call a liberal heresy that the Old Testament ceremonies and offerings were an invention of priestcraft. Many of your scholastic books try to give you the impression that those ceremonies were invented by the priests to give them a job or something. That's a liberal heresy. That's a, a, a viewpoint from the literature that undermines the reality of God's Word. That's a heresy, strangely enough. This view sees this section of Amos as the high ground of the Old Testament. Ethical and the Old Testament, ethical and religious taught. Goodness, fair play, kindness make up true religion. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. That may derive from true faith, but that also can be a synthetic. Biblical re revelation, in contrast to that, is the sacrificial system was foreshadowed. The substitutionary death of the Messiah. Hebrews 9 nails that down. The substitutionary death was pro prophesied in Genesis chapter 3 when he made them take off those fig leaf things and put on the coats of skins. He was teaching them that by the death of innocent blood they would be covered. That may sound strange, but verse 27, Genesis, from that point on, the whole biblical program is that every ceremony, every detail doesn't save you, doesn't get rid of sin. It points to the event that does that was on a cross in Judea some 2,000 years ago. And anything that simulates it may be illustrative in some way, but doesn't, that our focus is on what he did, not what we're doing. Conversion was demanded, not amendments. You don't add to what God has asked for. Outward appearances of devotion and did not prevent perversion of the intent of the sacrifices. They were giving sacrifices it, albeit it wasn't Dan and Bethel, the wrong places, but the point is, um, much of that would appear to comply with specific specifications. It was perverse. Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. This is God speaking through Amos. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat, fat beasts. The, the burnt offering, the Olah, was the, and the grain offering, the Minah, and the peace offering are each described in Leviticus as a soothing aroma, Yodivave. This suggests that the very sacrifices that were thought of as pleasing to God were not. In other words, the, these, setting aside the idolatry, these things also were not pleasing to God. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. But let judgment run down as waters, and righteousness as a mighty stream. See, justice and righteousness were missing. This is not to suggest that social justice is the total of all that God requires. No. But it's an indication that they weren't where they should be. Have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? By the way, some important manuscripts happen to delete... Uh, in the wilderness, but that's obviously what it's talking about anyway, so nothing lost here. But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and Shion, and uh, your images, the star of your God, which ye made to yourselves. Sikuth and Kayan, your images, the star. Uh, the King James Version is the tabernacle of your Moloch follows the Septuagint, but attaches a pronoun to the proper noun, an impossibility for the Hebrew. Now, I have to confess to you that the Hebrew here, all through, I mean, has some serious difficulties. Uh, nothing that really changes the meaning at all, but just to be aware of it. And of all the commentaries I've seen, the one that deals with this most forcefully and in detail is Finley's. Um, um, 
but uh, there isn't, you can go through all of that, there isn't anything distinctive that, that's pivotal. The Sikuth is really the booth of your king. Kayan is the pedestal of your images. This very well may be identified in the Hebrew for what was the Babylonian name for Saturn, uh, worshipping the hosts, the, the planets. Moloch and Kayan. Sikuth, Doth, Mikra, uh, uh, the god Sukkoth, the, in a cuneiform of Sakut. And some feel it was misunderstood by the Septuagint as the tent or tabernacle, and by the Vulgate, that is the Latin as tabernacle. Sakuth was the name of Adara, the Assyrian god of war. And Sakuth is called the uh, king because his name means king of decision or chief arbiter in war. And this is what this really means. Your king is misunderstood. Uh, you know, your king is misunderstood in the Septuagint as Molech. It doesn't really matter, because either way it's pagan, but there's some linguistic issues in there. Molech was the national gar god of Ammon. He was worshipped by the rebellious Judeans. Kayan, in, is, in, in the Arabic and Persian is uh, Kawan, and the Assyrian is Kai'avanu, the Babylonian name for the planet Saturn. It was the, the Egyptian god Seb, which is their name for Saturn. So again, we've got the names of some specific pagan worship going on here. The details are not pivotal to us, of course. Riphon and Ramphah is a little different. That's a form of Kayan. Strangely enough, that may sound, how could Riphon and Kayan be different? Because the older script, a resh, they could mistake a resh for a kaf in the Hebrew, or the pe for a vav. And uh, it turns out that Stephen quotes that from the Septuagint in Acts 7, verse 42. And so there is subtleties there. The Rephaim are the inhabitants of the netherworld, according to Psalm 88 and Proverbs 2 and Isaiah 26. And uh, the Rephaim, is, the root word means death, is the walking dead. And uh, it's also referred to inhabitants of Sheol in Proverbs 9 and Isaiah 14. It's a place of hopelessness. You and I cannot imagine being totally without hope. And that comes up all in Isaiah 26. Verse 14 is from verse 19 on in Isaiah 26 that I believe you have an allusion to the rapture, by the way. The valley of Rephaim is the valley of the giants in Joshua 15 and 18, both in the Septuagint and Josephus in his Antiquities. The valley of Rephaim, the valley of the giants. The giants may be the Nephilim, if you will. The sons of Anak, the Nephilim. That gets into the whole Genesis 6 thing. Nephilim, the word in the Hebrew means the fallen ones from the verb nephal. The progeny of the Nephilim were monsters. They were huge, they were tall, they were evil. And uh, in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of those passages, the word is gigantes, which in the Greek means the earthborn. Giga means earth, mother earth. Gigantes means earthborn. They did happen to be giants, so in your English it's the, it says they were giants in those days. No, but the Greek really means they were the earthborn, and they were hybrids from the fallen angels. But that, that's all in our studies on Genesis 6, if you want to get into that. Ancient, every ancient mythology records the same events, and, uh, every, including the American Indians, by the way. And uh, certainly the Greek mythology is all detailed about that. Fallen Angels and the Heroes of Mythology by John Fleming is one of the primary sources on all of this. Titans of, of the Egyptian mythology. They were partly terrestrial, partly celestial. They were the hybrids, okay? Like Hercules, Atlas. These were hybrids. These were Nephilim. And uh, they rebelled against their father Uranus, that in heaven, and after a prolonged contest were defeated by Zeus and condemned into Tartarus. And Titan in Greek is Shaitan in the Chaldean. That's Satan in Hebrew. The Anakim, and also after that, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, it speaks that they were those days and also after that. We find in, they show up again in Numbers 13 when, the, when Moses sends the spies to spy out the land. There were Nephilim in the land in those days. The bedstead of one of them was 13 feet long. Yes, they were giants, but that's not what the word really means. The men of Israel said, we are grasshoppers before their sight. When we read that in Numbers 13, we think, boy, what gutless guys. No, how would you like to go up against guys that are 13 feet tall? We're like grasshopper. They, the, you know, they, they had a legitimate concern. But Joshua and Caleb said, so what? God's on our side. He'll deal with it. In 
It's strange, why does Israel refer to their second appearance in the Old Testament as Nephilim, or fallen ones? Because it was a repeat of what happened in Genesis 6, in the land of Canaan. That's why Joshua was instructed by God to wipe out all the men, women, and children of four key tribes. Because there was a gene pool problem from all this nonsense. Goliath, David, when he crossed the brook, took f put five stones in his pocket. One in which he took down Goliath. Where were the other four for? Because Goliath had four brothers. <laughs> David was ready for all of them. The Hebrews were infected with Sabianism. That's the worship of Saba, the starry hosts. They worshiped the stars. Instead of Yorivavi, the god of the hosts. And that's where the planet Mars fits in so prominently. That's why the word in Arabic for Mars is Cairo. Why was the city of Cairo named Cairo? Well, there's a whole thing about that. You can check our things on the flood of Noah, our briefing packs on the monuments sacred or profane, and signs in the heavens, or just our, commentary, our textual commentaries to pick up on this stuff. The worship of demons, of course, is prohibited in Deuteronomy 32 and 1 Corinthians 10 and elsewhere. See, the point is, very interesting point, in Psalm 135, 18, and also in Psalm 115, verse 8, the Word of God tells us that you become like the gods you worship. <clears throat> is the world cold and unforgiving? If you worship the world, you'll become cold and unforgiving. Is the world materialistic? If you worship the world, you'll become materialistic. We go right down the list. Whatever it is you're worshiping, you'll become like that. That's why it's imperative that you worship Christ, so that you become like Him. Not complicated. <laughs> Therefore will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. That's quoted from the Septuagint by Stephen in Acts 7, verse 42, 43, interpretively, of course. Babylon substituted for Damascus idiomatically because he was speaking after the northern kingdom had been scattered beyond Damascus by the Assyrians and after Judah had been carried beyond Babylon in 586. So he's justified from a historical perspective to substitute Babylon, you see, for Damascus, because it is idiomatically, it become Babylon. And he takes that liberty, when in, in, in Stephen does, in his rendering of all this in chapter 7. Chapter 7 of Acts is one of the most interesting historical chapters in the book, because Stephen is going to tell you all kinds of things that go beyond what the text actually says. You'll find out all kinds of things. You'll find out that Abram wasn't really faithful. He was supposed to leave his father. He didn't. He just moved up river until his father died. And all those subtleties show up if you really study Acts 7 carefully. Anyway, both were fulfilled. People of the northern kingdom were carried beyond Babylon to the far corners of the Syrian Empire. Sukkoth, your king, that refers to the tabernacle of Moloch. Kion, your divine image, your star guard, that's the god of the god, god Rompha. Anyway, let's move on to Amos 6. We're still going to make this, okay. Amos 6 talks about misplaced confidence. They have a false sense of security. Why? Because they've abandoned the greatness of their nation. Gee, are we talking about them or America? Why were we great? Alexis de Tocqueville, in the 19th century, wrote a book, Democracy in America. And after studying America, he said, America is great because it's good. If it ever ceases to be good, it'll cease to be great. In Hosea and Amos, God is going to wipe out a group that have abandoned their heritage after two centuries. They had a heritage that's two centuries deep, and they abandoned it, and God wiped them out. We have a heritage that's two centuries deep, that we've abandoned. We've outlawed God out of the schoolrooms. We've made it illegal to give public prayers. And I could go on and on. I don't need to. So it's Israel's ease to turn, Israel's ease is going to turn to suffering. And Amos' focus is now going to go on the wealthy classes. 
Woe to them that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria. That was the capital, the mountain of Samaria. Gorgeous place, by the way. Which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. Woe. Hoy. Admonition and lamentation. Trust. Batach. The word batach means in false confidence. 132 times in the Old Testament. 130 of those, it's in the sense of false confidence, not true confidence. Pass you into Calne and see, and from thence go into Hamath the Great, and go, then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Be they better than these kingdoms? Or they're better, greater than the, your border? These are places starting up north of Damascus, then to Gath, and then to Hamath the Great. And then it, it's a geographic thing. These were great cities that are now rubble. Are you better than them, is the question? That's God asking. Calne. These three were once great, unable to withstand the assault and diminution of the territories. They had now fallen into decay. Hamath and Gath. Calne was Babylonia's Syrian capital city, filled with temples on the east bank of the Tigris River. Nimrod's Calne in the land of Shinar, Genesis 10. This is what we would call Iraq, okay? Capital of North Ar uh, Armenian, Aramean kingdom of Patan or Unki. They, they were conquered in 738 B.C. by the Assyrian Tiglath Pileser III. Hamath, capital of the Syrian state of the same name, was located on the banks of the Aronis River in Aram. It was the center of a powerful kingdom with a history back at least to the 14th century B.C. Shalmaneser III of Assyria conquered the city in the mid-9th century B.C. It was later forced into submission by Tiglath Pileser III in, uh, in uh, 730 B.C., and then by Sargon II in 720 B.C. Gath is one of the five capitals of the Philistines, and by this time, of course, lost its grandeur. Hazael, the king of Aram, captured Gath and was so impressed with himself that he laid siege to Jerusalem. Later, his eye of Judah broke down the wall of Gath during a campaign against the Philistines. After Sargon II of Assyria captured, the city drops out of known history. We're not sure exactly where it was anymore. There's different views. Anyway, moving on. Ye that put far away the evil day and caused the seed of violence to come near. Uh, put away, that's the, the word is nadad, to push away, to the day of reckoning, push it away, out of your mind kind of thing. Put off. To remove or cast out someone or something. The Talmud designates this as excommunication. Rephrasing it, do you think God can eliminate, you think you can eliminate God's coming day of judgment by excommunicating it from your lives or thoughts? And obviously, it's a facetious rhetorical question. Yom Ra means the day of evil, and the Nagash means pulling close, sinful, violent lives. Hamas means violence. As you know, Hamas means violence. You know that. Uh, sinful oppression. That lie upon the beds of ivory that stretch themselves upon their couches that eat the lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the stall. These are symptoms of wealth in those days. The good life, if you will. Banquets are not necessarily sinful. Jesus frequented them. But these were in, uh, in mockery of God. Crawford ex excavation of Samaria, uh, 1931. They found ivory plaques, sculptured panels, inlaid pieces, furniture dowels, found a bow relief of the, the lotus, the lilies, the papyrus, the lions, the bulls, the deer, winged features, all kinds of, it, obviously, tangible evidence of the luxury and the elegance in Samaria. It was the capital of the northern kingdom. That chant to the sound of the vial and invent to themselves instruments of music like David. That drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the chief ointments, but they are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Misrach, sacrificial bowls. They were intended as holy basins of the altar. They're here. They're used in drunken celebrations. And I'm reminded of Daniel 5. You may recall that uh, Belshazzar. He not only... Through, the, 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 the Persians were ready to attack. He doesn't strengthen, he thought they were invincible because of the moats and all that business, so instead he throws a party. Bad news. But what he really messes up, he sends across the street to the museum to get the vessels, the sacred vessels that they captured from the Jews 70 years earlier, to use as party vessels. Big mistake. Big mistake. They see a finger right on the wall, and you know the story. But again, see, they were using the sacred, things that were intended for sacred purposes for drunken celebrations. The parallel is legitimate. The finest of oils intended to anoint the people of God's service. These were all anointing things. 
And these also were used in massages. There's no grieving over sin, no weeping or prayer for the nation. Do you weep for the nation? Do you spend time on your knees at home weeping for this country? To tremble before anticipated ills is to bemoan what you've never lost. There's time. Amos, verse 7. Therefore now shall they go captive with the first that go captive, and the banquet of them that stretch themselves shall be removed. See, God could have delivered them from the hands of the Assyrians. The Egyptians, gods Isis and Horus, couldn't lift a wing to help them. Do you think they need a course in improving their self-esteem? <laughs> I don't think so. Those who have made themselves conspicuous by their extravagance will soon be conspicuous by their absence, is another way of paraphrasing verse 7. The Lord God hath sworn by himself, saith the Lord, the God of hosts, I abhor the excellency of Jacob, and I hate his palaces. Therefore will I deliver up the, the city with all that is there, uh, here, therein. I loathe the arrogance of Jacob and the citadels I hate. I wonder if Amos's chariot had a bumper sticker proclaiming, smile, God loves you. <laughs> okay. It shall come to pass that if there remain ten men in one house, that they shall die. If a man's uncle shall take him up, and he that burneth him to bring out the bones out of the house, he shall say unto him that is by the sides of the house, Is there yet any with thee? And he shall say, No. Then shall he say, Hold thy tongue, for we may not make mention of the name of the Lord. See, even, even praise will be inappropriate. And by the way, the term undertake here is miseraf, a burner. It's an allusion to cremation. It's one of the few places in the Bible you find it. Cremation is always a pagan issue. A lot of people say, well, Christian, it shouldn't make any sense. Yes, it does. Not in terms of the bones, but in terms of your testimony. A burial is a testimony of an anticipated resurrection. Cremation was always, now it's not a big deal, but at the same time, cremation is not a biblical answer. I always like to give something else to give you a guilt trip on, you know. Unusual reference to cremation here. You'll find a couple of others, but not many. And it's always in a pagan context. For behold, the Lord com commandeth, and he will smite the great house with breaches and a, the little house with clefts. Shall horses run upon the rock? Will one plow where there, are, with, there with oxen? For ye have turned judgment into gall, and the fruit of righteousness into hemlock. The futility of two inequalities is basically what we're dealing with here. Ye which rejoice in a thing of naught, which say, Have we not taken to us horns by our own strength? <coughs> Lowly debar, no word. Uh, it's an idiom for nothing. It doesn't matter, forget it. The city of Lodibar is located in Gilead. That's a question mark. Possibly Mannheim. There is a, there is a, maybe a city there, or it may be just an idiom for nothing. And a uh, thing of naught, uh, no word. And uh, the word horns there, is, there's some word play going on here. Karnaim is located east of the Sea of Galilee, but Karnaim is also the word for horns, or power or glory of an animal. So it's, this is parallel with Batash, false confidence. Taking those horns of your own strength. It's, not, it, it, it's obviously inadequate. But behold, I will raise up against you a nation, O house of Israel, saith the Lord, the God of hosts, and they shall afflict you from the entering in of Hamath unto the river of the wilderness. And... Uh, the word afflict there is lachatz, which is to press or squeeze. This is the same word that's used in Balaam's donkey being squeezed against the wall in Numbers 22, or a man being pushed outside against the door in 2 Kings 6. The word afflict is to press or squeeze, is all I'm trying to say there. God is about to push and squeeze Israel out of Samaria, is what that essentially means. And uh, Hamath marked one of the northern boundaries of Israel. The brook of Arabah. Now, Arabah is the dry southland desert between the Dead Sea and the Gulf of Elat, or Aqaba. Some identify it with the, with the Kidron, east of Jerusalem, others with the Nile. 
it implies beyond the northern kingdom's borders the point, that without quibbling about exactly what idiomatically they're pointing to. It's, uh, uh, you know, it's rhetoric. Jer Jeroboam II gained control of the broad territory east of the Jordan, extending uh, from Lebo to, to the Baca Valley of Lebanon um, on the border with Hamath to the Dead Sea. He dominated the entire length of the king's highway in Transjordan from the border of Edom to that of Hamath. He was, see, that was a huge, huge, northern kingdom was a huge empire. Doesn't matter. It's over. This all was allowed because the Lord permitted it. They don't acknowledge that. Assyria, by the way, fills prophecies. You know, Hosea 11, Micah 7, 2 Kings. In chapter 6, it, the whole issue here is misplaced confidence. And the question we need to ask ourselves, what is your confidence, correction, what is our confidence based on? Think about it. It's important. On America? You know, there's a point at which patriotism can be a false idol. My parents are foreign born. I was, I'm a Naval Academy graduate. After my service career, I spent 30 years in the strategic arena. Think tanks. Intelligence community. I was chairman and CEO of six public companies. Four of those were publicly traded defense contractors. I'm not an America basher. But that was a different America. We stood for liberty, not democracy. We were a re constitutional republic. We don't have a constitution anymore. There's a point at which patriotism can be a form of idol worship. Is your comments based on our government? I don't have to have a show of hands here. Confidence in our banks? Our economy? What? What is your confidence in? Think about it. And then what are you going to do about it? You got a view? Great. Translate it into action. Are you going to take God seriously? Great. How? Well, I'm going to get rid of some baggage. Good. Okay, fine. What else are you going to do? That's one of the reasons we've organized the Coiny Institute. It's a voluntary fellowship of people that want to take the Bible seriously. And whatever they want to do, great. We'll try to help them do it. But do it. See, to get out of shape, to deteriorate, you know what you've got to do? You know what you have to do to, to, to deteriorate? Nothing. Nothing. Likewise, Financially, spiritually, maritally. All you have to do is nothing to deteriorate it. Are you investing in your marriage? Are you taking it seriously? Or you take it for granted? That's, I, I look back at my life, one of the biggest mistakes I've made is I took my marriage for granted. 53 years we've been married. And I took her for granted. Praise God for that patient woman. Didn't abuse her. But I did by neglect. I took it for granted. I was too busy with my career and all that stuff. Are you investing in your marriage? Are you investing in your spiritual growth? Do you have a study Bible? Are you enlisted in some kind of systematic program to really learn your Bible? You won't do that listening to a sermon once a week. You want to be in a small group, taking it seriously. Financially, are you deteriorating financially? Boy, that takes diligence today. Think about it. Are you working on all three? Hope so. Okay. Well, we've been through this. We were in chapters 5 and 6 tonight. In the next session, we're going to take chapters 7 and 8, and we'll discover that 8's pretty short, and we can sw sneak in a little bit of 9 if we, the time works out right. So I encourage you to read chapters 7 and 8, and it won't hurt you to read 9 because you're going to be anxious to figure out what the last five verses mean. Because we're going to devote the session after that really getting into some big surprises, for many, of the Davidic kingdom. Gee, I thought Amos was talking about the northern kingdom. The Davidic kingdom is the kingdom of Judah to the south, right? Our king is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Right? The Davidic kingdom is going to be restored. Nine out of ten, at least, churches in America don't believe in the millennium. 
they're called, they're called amillennial. They think it's just a metaphor. And they have an elaborate way of justifying their view. Well, without getting into that, that's not our view. In fact, we, take the, we have the fear that if you take that view, you run the risk of calling God a liar. Because the Davidic kingdom was promised to Mary in Luke chapter 1. Her son would sit on the, throne of, on the throne of David that wasn't around during the Roman period. The pivotal event in the book of Acts is the council for Jerusalem. And James himself reads from Amos chapter 9 in responding to that, that the, how, the, the tabernacle of David is going to be reestablished. Don't confuse that with the temple of Solomon. The tabernacle of David was a palace a kingship, if you will. I'm not saying it isn't both, but understand there's a distinction. Interesting time coming up. You pray the Lord's Prayer? How many pray the Lord's Prayer? 80%. Pretty good. All right. Thy kingdom come, you pray. What's that praying for? There's probably not one Christian in 20 that knows what that's about. Thy kingdom come. Sounds pretty good. Kingdom of heaven or something. No, it's a kingdom from heaven. It's a Genesis of source. It's a kingdom on the earth that's going to wipe out the other kingdoms. Really? You're kidding. Well, we'll see. Next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.